Uh, in Ezra. So what's Ezra about? So Ezra is a story of the Jews going back into their land. You know, as we were studying through Jeremiah, we're seeing, you know, just, uh, just uh, prior to their captivity by the Babylonians, but Ezra deals, and like, like Nehemiah as well, deals with the Jews going back into their land after their period of captivity. And Ezra deals primarily with the rebuilding of the temple. Okay? Now notice there in verse number 16, Ezra chapter 7, verse number 16, and all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the free will offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. I just want you to notice the term there, the house of their God. In verse number 17, that, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. Drop down to verse number 19. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem, verse number 20, and whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt, uh, shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. Just to prove to you that this chapter deals primarily with the house of God, and of course that's the rebuilt uh, temple. That's the new temple, the rebuilt temple, which was not as glorious, not as beautiful as Solomon's temple. Uh, but it's the same temple that when Jesus Christ would come to this earth 2,000 years ago, he would walk the earth and that would be the temple that he would be pointing to, right? That was the one that was built in Jerusalem. Now, of course, uh, we're going, we're continuing our Decently and In Order series. And when we talk about the house of God, as I taught to you on Sunday, we're dealing now in the New Testament with the local church. You know, the local church right now, the gathering together, this is the house of of the Lord. You know, I was in here earlier. I was in here earlier just preparing my sermon. I was here all by myself. I could not call this building the house of God when I was here all by myself. That's not the house of God. As I taught you guys, it's not the building, okay? But it's the people of God that make up the church. It's the people of God that make up the house of God in the New Testament, all right? Now, with that in, in mind, please go to verse number nine, Ezra chapter seven, verse number nine. And I love, I love Ezra's attitude. Because brethren, you know, our, our time is short on this earth. You know, you may live some 70, 80, 90 years maybe, you know, Lord willing. We don't know when the Lord is coming back. We might live a lot shorter than that. And you know what? I, I don't know about you, but I want everything I do, everywhere I go, every friend that I make, I want it to be profitable. I, I want it to be a good use of my time. You know, I, I've taught before that as a, as a father of 11 children, a, a big household, Time has become more important to me than money. You know, sometimes people say, well, do this, it will save you money. Yeah, but it will take me so much more time. Like, I'd rather just pay somebody else to do it, okay? I don't, I don't care about money. You know, my money goes, and my time's important. And so wherever I invest my time, wherever I spend my time, I want it to be profitable. You know, I, I want it to be, to be beneficial. And brethren, you know, when we talk about the house of God, when we talk about church, I want you to come to church and... and, 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 and uh, you know, for it to be a, a benefit to you, for it to be profitable to you. The last thing I want for you, brethren, is to come to church and it's all vanity, it's all empty. You know, you do it out of practice. You do it out just because you feel like that, that's something I need to do. That's just, you know, I tick my box because I've come to church this week. You know, but you get nothing out of church. You know, it's, if it's not profitable for you, brethren, you know, do we really want church then? Like we want church to be a place where we profit, a place that we learn, a place that we grow, a place that we can uh, you know, lay up treasures, not just on this earth, but of course treasures in heaven. That's where it's important, right? Hey, some profit is on this earth. You know, going soul winning and being able to preach the gospel, sometimes just, just uh, knowing that I've you know, got the opportunity to preach the gospel, someone gets saved. Sometimes it's profitable on this earth because I get encouraged, I get motivated, I see the, uh, the, the, the gospel, the word of God, you know, still works today. But at the end of the day, the prophet is in heaven. You know, there are days we go out soul winning and we don't see anybody saved. But we don't, okay, maybe we didn't we, you know, necessarily profit on this earth, but we know we've profited in heaven because we've done the works that God has asked us to do. And so, so I'm not talking about just profiting on this earth, okay? The great thing about being a Christian is that as long as we're doing God's will, even though we're not getting anything out of it in this earth, in fact, many times we're called to minister, we're called to serve somebody else. Hey, we might profit somebody else, but we know that our treasures are being laid up in heaven. That's what's important, okay? But I love Ezra because Ezra says, okay, we've rebuilt the temple. You know, it's this, this house of God is important. You know, church is important. And you see here in verse number nine, 
Ezra's attitude. It says, For upon the first day of the month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. Now look at verse number 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of, of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. What do you learn about Ezra? Before he goes to the house of God, Ezra prepares his heart. He prepares himself before he goes to the house of God because he wants it to profit. In what way does he want it to profit? It says that to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. So that's, you know, yes, I'm going to prepare myself for church because I want to see what God's word has to say to me and I want to do it. Not only that, it says, and to teach. He says, look, I've got to, I've got to prepare myself because I also have to teach. And brethren, whether it's the person in the, behind the pulpit that teaches or if it's the person uh, in the congregation that's learning things to do certain things for the house of God, we have to prepare ourselves for God's house. Whether you're the preacher or you're just someone coming to listen uh, and to participate of the church, we need to prepare ourselves for church. And so, brethren, I want you to come to church and I want it to profit you. I want it to be beneficial. I want you to walk away from church and say, man, that was the best hour you know, that I spent. You know, this is the best place I could have been for the last hour. You know, maybe I had some other things to do, maybe some other th things in my mind that I had to do, but thank God I came to church for that hour, that hour and a half, those two hours, because it was beneficial. I learned something. Now I know what God wants me to do. Wow, you know, I was able to praise God. I was able to give God worship. We want church to be a place that we profit. And so we need to prepare ourselves for church. And the title for the sermon this evening is How to Get the Most Out of Church. How to Get the Most Out of Church. And yes, preaching is part of it, brethren. But you know what? You can have the best preacher in the world behind this pulpit preaching to you every week. But if you've not prepared yourself, it's not going to be beneficial. You need to prepare yourself to come to church. And so I've got seven uh, points here, just very practical teaching, how to get the most out of church. All right? Now let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, please. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25. And if I get passionate about this, brethren, it's because I love church. I love church. You know, not just because I'm preaching. I just love the people of God. I love being together with the people of God. Because we deal with this world Monday to Fridays, you know. We, 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 we deal with the, the corruption. We deal with the sin. You know, and it's good to be in a place where we just, you know, where things are normal. Where people are normal. Where God's word is being taught and we understand what is right and wrong. I, I, love, I love God's house. I love his church. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25, uh, the, the first, before we read that, the first uh, point that I have for you is do not make church attendance a decision. Don't make it a decision in your life. You know, just, just get into the practice. Hey, it is, is our normal practice every week to be in God's house. Every week to be in church, it, it's just as normal as going to work. It's as normal as waking up and getting out of the pajamas and putting on clothes. It's as normal as eating my breakfast. It's, it's as normal as, uh, you know, uh, having a shave if you, if you have a shave. Whatever it is, it's as normal. You know, going to church should just be a normal practice. It shouldn't be, honey, should we go to church today? That shouldn't be the way it is. You know, you should already have that in your mind. It's not a decision. That's where God wants me to be. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What we learn in this verse here is that there is a manner of some people, the manner of some is, it is their uh, pattern in life to miss out on church. You know, you, you kind of, they, maybe they turn up to church, but you kind of expect them to not be in church. Right? Like, you know, for some people, you expect them to always be in church. You kind of have an idea, you know, you know who's going to be there. And when, when people are not in church, when, when people don't turn up for, to church for two weeks, three weeks, you know, you start wondering, hey, there must be something wrong with that person. Maybe that person is sick. Maybe that person's been hurt. Maybe something has happened to this person. And you start being a little bit concerned because they haven't turned up to church. But then there are other people that don't turn up for months. And it doesn't even, you know, it, you know, we don't even think about that person necessarily because we know their manner is to not be in church. We know their manner is not to turn up. And so it's usual for us for them not to be here. 
But then when they do turn up, it's a surprise. And it's a blessing. You know, it's good to see brother so-and-so, but we're, we're, we're kind of accustomed to that person not turning up. And so for some, it is the manner to not turn up for church. You know, for them, it's a decision. Do I go today? Do I not go today? Oh, I've got some other things I need to do. I'm going to prioritize that over church. If we want to get the most out of church, brethren, don't make church attendance a decision. Okay? Just turn up when you know you need to turn up. And look, what does it mean to forsake the assembling of ourselves together? You know, I've heard some preaching, and I disagree with this. Some, some, some preachers, and, and look, though these pastors, they mean well. I'm sure they mean well. But some pastors basically say, if you miss one service, right, you forsake in the assembly. Like, uh, you know, you better be in hospital. You better have like a broken arm, because if you miss church, you forsake in the assembly. That's, that's not, that, that's pretty severe. Okay, there are other legitimate reasons why, you know, you may not turn up to church services. Restrictions might be one of them, all right? But there might be, look, for, to forsake, this is what, the, look up the dictionary. What does forsake mean? It's not complicated. To forsake means to abandon or leave. To abandon or leave. Where you make a decision and say, you know what, church is not for me anymore. I don't want to be in God's house. Even though there are people meeting today, I'm not going to go there anymore because I'm sick and tired of church. I'm going to forsake. I'm going to abandon church. That's what it means to forsake church. If you miss a service for some legitimate reason, so be it. You know, if, if there's someone in church that doesn't turn up for service, I'm not upset with you. Like, I, I'm just, well, there must have been something must have come up that was that important for them to miss church. And I'd rather think best of people that I hope that was serious enough for them to have to make that decision that they had to miss church this time. But look, I'm just, those are obviously the exceptions. But our usual practice should be that we're just there. Hey, God's house is open. God's people are meeting. I'm going to be there because I want to be close to God and I want to fellowship with God's people. Okay? It's not a decision. And look, it said there at the end of verse number 25, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I love that because we can apply that for our church. Hey, when Blessed Hope Baptist Church started meeting, we were only meeting once a week. When we're not. <laughs> you know, for the midweek services, we're meeting once a week. And then once our brother David came on board and we were able to have another preacher there behind the pulpit, hey, we've gone to twice a week. Hey, praise God. And guess what we're doing now? Three times a week. Hey, even the more as we see the day approaching. And so that's a good thing, you know, increasing the amount of times we gather together, you know, and, and serve the Lord and worship God is a good thing. And a church that's only adding services, a church that's only doing more, and we're doing other things. We're going soul winning on Saturdays, and we've got the Fridays with the men that sometimes they're doing the Bible studies, that's tomorrow as well. You know, we're doing more and more because we want to learn more of what God says. We want to, we want to please the Lord, and we realize we live in an evil day, and therefore we need to be amongst our brethren even, even more so. Right, and so I, I like that because I see that this is a church that, or these, you know, there are people in this church that don't have a habit of forsaking God's church, but actually desire to be more and more in God's house, especially as our day becomes wicked. All right, now just for me, a personal story. Um, you know, I grew up in a household where we basically only really went to church on Sunday mornings. You know, I was, I was uh, grew up in a Baptist Union church, and you know, we, we, we didn't miss church like we went every week. But it was mainly the, the Sunday mornings. That was a service that we would always go to. And I always wondered, why do people go Sunday night? I don't understand. Like, I've already been there. Because, you know, you get into a habit, you know. Yeah, okay, we went to church this morning. Why do people go at night? I have no idea. People go midweeks as well. What, what's that about? Midweek service, you know. I, I, and, you know, eventually I got myself into independent Baptist church. And then I started around because I'm actually learning things. Not, not only learning things on, on Sunday morning. I was like, man, I'm going to go tonight because I want to learn even more. Right? And then so I, you know, I developed a habit with myself and Christina. We would go on Sundays. We would go to the Sunday service, uh, both the morning and the evening service. And then eventually, uh, you know, I'd make the, the, the occasional midweek services, the occasional ones. Uh, but what got me going to the midweek service, in fact, the midweek service became my favorite service. You know, believe it or not, more than Sundays. And the reason I got into the midweek service is my pastor said to me, Hey, Kevin, would you like to preach for us one day? You know, the very first time I got the opportunity to preach at church. He says, look, you know, there's, there's an opportunity coming up on Wednesday. Can you come in on Wednesday and preach for us? I was like, praise God. You know, I was asking God, hey, God, are you going to give me an opportunity to preach? Because maybe one day I'd like to become a pastor. I already have those thoughts in mind. Hey, this opportunity opened up. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go on Wednesday. And I, I got there on Wednesday, and I preached God's Word. And, you know, it was my first time, and I thought I did okay for my first time, and I was excited. But then I felt like a hypocrite. Because I'm like, well, why did I turn up for midweek service? Because I preached. And then I was like, man, 
If I'm going to preach on Wednesdays for midweek service and I don't turn up next week for the midweek service, I feel like a bit of a hypocrite. <laughs> you know, I feel a bit embarrassed, right, by that. So I started going to the midweek service and then I became a three times a week, you know, uh, church attending uh, Christian, right? I'd go there, you know, three times a week, I had other opportunities to preach. But I found out that Wednesday was my favorite service because the church that I was going to on Wednesdays, they would have a prayer time after the preaching. Okay, and what I found during that prayer time is, you know, because you go to church and you sort of you say hello and, you know, people go about their business, they have their own lives. But when you get together and you start to pray for one another, I started to realize, man, some of these people I go to church with, they've got problems. They've got hurts. They've got worries. They've got sicknesses. I didn't know. Right. I mean, I, was, I guess I was so preoccupied in my own problems in my life. I forgot that there were other people in church with issues and problems. And when we got together to pray about this, I found out that I started to love my brethren even more because I realized they have needs. And sometimes I can help them in their needs. Or if I can't help them, at least I can pray for them. And then what else did I find out on Wednesdays? When I had a need for prayer. Hey, uh, one time when I didn't have a job, brethren, can you please pray for me? Hey, they prayed for me. I got a job next week. Praise God. Hey, I had a need. There was a situation and, and the brethren prayed for me. I felt loved by the brethren. And so Wednesdays became my favorite because I started to love the people. I started to love. It wasn't just the preaching of God's word. It wasn't just the singing. It was getting together with believers and I knew they loved me and I loved them and we prayed together. <laughs> and so you know what, what we're going to be doing with this church uh, starting from next year, starting January next year, our midweek services are going to be a little bit shorter in the preaching and we're going to be praying, okay? Well, I'm going to be asking you guys for prayer requests. Please bring your requests. Let's get into this habit of being open with one another. We can share certain things so we can pray for one another, okay? That is so important, okay? All right, so point number one, do not make church attendance a decision. Can you please turn to Psalm 119? Psalm 119 for me. And I'm just going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, which is where we got the title for this series, which says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Let all things be done decently and in order. And of course, the direct context of that is in church. You know, church ought to be a place where things are done orderly, where there's order, where there's decency. Okay, it's not just one person getting up and preaching, and one other person says, I want to preach, I want to preach, I want to, and, and people just praying all over each other. Man, you go to some of those Pentecostal churches, it's a mess. It sounds like a zoo because people are just praying on top of each other and they're not even praying in English, they're praying in their gibberish language, which nobody understands. Hey, that's a situation where things are not done decently and in order. And so the point number two that I have for you, brethren, is remove all distractions. If you want to get the most out of church, you have to remove all distractions. Whatever might cause chaos in church, whatever may cause chaos in your mind, you've got to set those things aside and pay attention and be focused on the house of God. Okay? Now, you're turning to uh, Psalm 119 and verse number 8. I just want to show you this, Psalm 119, verse, sorry, verse number 18, verse number 18, sorry, Psalm 119 and verse number 18, look at this, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Brethren, this is a great uh, prayer to pray to God when you come to church. Ask God, God, can you open my eyes because I want to see great things in the Word of God. I want to learn something great today, Lord. Please open my eyes. You know what the psalmist is saying here? Not the palmist. <laughs> Joe Biden. You guys seen that? <laughs> it's not the palmist. It's the psalmist. What is he saying? He doesn't want to be distracted. He doesn't want chaos in his mind. He doesn't want things to be blurry. He wants things to be clear. And he asks God, God, can you open my eyes? Brethren, the psalmist did not want distractions when he learnt God's word. And brethren, that's how we need to, uh, that's what we need to make the most out of church is remove all distractions. And brethren, let me tell you, when, when church service is on, please do everything to be on time or be before the time. Please do that. You know, when you come late to church, and look, some people have legitimate reasons they come late to church, especially if they're traveling afar. I understand, you know. But for, for those that are able to make it on time and you still miss out on parts of the service, you know, you're not distracting me as a preacher. 
You may not even be distracting other people in the church, but you've caused a distraction for yourself. You've missed part of the service. And listen, the first part of the service, what are we doing? We're singing. We're, we're giving praise to God. Right? We're, we're lifting up our hearts. We're magnifying God. We're opening our mouths. We're praising God, brethren. And when you miss out on that, you know, there's a lot of people like that. They turn up to church just in time for the preaching. Well, you've caused a massive distraction for yourself because church is not just the preaching. Okay? Church also includes the, singings, the singing of praises to God. And you know what? There are so many uh, great hymns in our hymn book. You know, a lot of these hymns are full of doctrine where you may have learned some great truth just by singing those hymns, but you turned up late and you missed it. You know, God wants to receive your worship. God wants to receive your praise. And when you miss out at the beginning of church, you, you know, you, you, you've caused a disservice for yourself. You're not, you're not making the most out of church as if you turned up on time. And it's not just the preaching. It's not just the singing. It might just be the prayer. It might be the opening prayer. It might be when I ask Brother, Brother Luke, could you open in a word of prayer? And, and Brother Luke touches upon something. He asks God to bless us in a certain way. And that might be exactly how God intended you to hear or to receive something from the Lord that day. But brethren, we need to avoid distractions from ourselves. Children. It's important for our children to learn to sit still in church. Okay? And look, I don't expect, I'm a father of many children, you know, I don't expect my children to be just, you know, children to be completely quiet, you know, where, where, where they, don't, they don't make a noise. You know, if, if you have children, they're going to make noise. There's going to be some element of noise. Hey, but it's a good thing for children to learn to sit down and understand for the next hour, I'm going to hear God's word. For the next hour, I'm going to just settle myself so I can praise God, so I can receive something from God. Hey, so they're not distracted, number one, and others in the church are not distracted either. Okay? And the best way that I found for my children to not uh, be fidgety in church is we got them used to sitting down silently at home, listening to some level of preaching, or mum opening up the Bible, you know, singing songs, and you get the children used to just sitting down, being still, and so when they come to church, they're not a distraction. Okay? Point number two is remove all distractions. Uh, the next point that I want to... Oh, sorry, within this, within this thing, um, if you find yourself to be easily distracted... What I really recommend you to do, and some people already do this, which is awesome, but what I really recommend you to do, especially if you have a desire one day to be a preacher, maybe a pastor, etc., is write down, you know, bring a pen and paper, you know, take down notes. It's going to help you because it's one thing to see the preacher, it's one thing to listen to the preaching, but you're adding another dimension to your church attendance when you write down things that you've learned. When you write down passages, maybe I've said something and you couldn't really get it, but you write down the, the reference of the Bible and you can go back in your own time and look it up once again. And look, that I, I found for me, when, when I would write down notes sometimes, that it helped me be focused on the preaching instead of being distracted with other things. Okay, and I think that's really beneficial because especially if you do want to become a preacher one day, a pastor one day, you know, if you've got down your notes that you've been able to capture during preaching, you're going to have a wealth of knowledge you know, that you've been able to capture, that you can go back to as a resource if one day you want to teach something similar, you know, you've got all that material that you've had, you know, in your preparation to one day be a church pastor. And so taking down notes is a great way to remove uh, distractions. Okay, another way that we can remove all distractions, can you please turn to uh, James chapter 1? Turn to James chapter 1 for me. James chapter 1, verse number 21. James chapter 1 and verse number 21. And I've, I've preached this before. I've said it before. And I feel like this is just a, one of the main things I want to teach this church. Like, brethren, if there's only one thing you learn from Pastor Kevin, all right, during these 12 months that I'm down here, if there's only one thing that you learn, say, oh, this is the thing that I really learned from Pastor Kevin, this is what I want you to learn, okay? Confess your sins to the Lord. I know I've said it before. But I know, because I'm a human being, I know what it's like. I know we, we commit sins and we forget to confess it to the Lord. Or we become prideful and we get comfortable in our sins. Or we become ashamed and we feel too ashamed to come before God and tell Him of our sins. But brethren, this is one way to remove all distractions, is to go to God and confess our sins. Look at James chapter 1, verse 21. 
James chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible reads, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, that, that's talking about excess of naughtiness, look at this, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Brethren, when you come to church, I know you want to come and receive the engrafted word. You want to receive the word of God. You want to learn something from the word of God. Well, before you can learn the word of God, there is something you need to do. You need to lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You need to get rid of that sin out of your life. You know what? You come to church and you have unconfessed sin. You're full of sin and you're not walking in the Lord. You're not going to get the best. You're not going to make the most out of church. I promise you that. You know, the, the flesh is going, to, is going to be engorged with its own pleasures. You know that the Spirit of, of God will be resisted. It will be withheld from helping you walk in His ways. Brethren, just, just, if there's only one thing you learned from me, okay, during these 12 months, it was that Pastor Kevin told us we have to confess our sins to the Lord. Do it every day. And do it before you come to church. I do it before I get up and preach. Every time. I get up, before I get up and preach, I'm praying, Lord, help me preach. Forgive me for the sins I've done, Lord. Help me be a clean vessel. Help me be a vessel that you can use. Uh, use your spirit to, to work in me to help feed the people of God. You know, if, if we're just bogged down in our sins and we're just not going to the Lord, brethren, you're not going to be walking with Him. You're going to be resisting the Holy Ghost from working your life. And you're, not going, to, you're going to be blinded from the Word of God. You know, you can have the best preach behind the pulpit, but you're not going to be profiting from it because you're far from God. Okay? Confess your sins to the Lord. So point number one, do not make church attendance a decision. Number two, remove all distractions. Point number three, you're in, uh, can you please turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 5? Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Point number 3. Expect to hear from God. Expect to hear from God. Now, think about this, brethren. If you knew that every time you come to church, you would hear from God. Like, if that was just your expectation, wouldn't that just make you be in church? <laughs> like, just, I'm going to hear from God today. Now, if you get into the habit of thinking, well, I'm not going to hear from God... I'm going to get, uh, I don't know. You know, that's when you're going to start missing church services. You know, but expect to hear from God. If you expect to hear from God, you're more likely to turn up to the house of God. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 11. Paul here, I believe it's Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews. He's writing, writing this to Hebrew believers. He says in verse number 11, Of whom we have many things to say, he says, I've got a lot to say to you. I've got a lot to preach to you. All right? There's a lot to be said. The Bible is a big book. There's a lot to learn. But then it says here, and uh, many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Brethren, we've got to be careful that we don't go to church and become dull of hearing. Oh, again, that same, uh, Pastor Kevin's going to preach again. Oh, he's preaching about a church attendance. Like, yeah, we already know we need to attend church. Listen, don't become dull of hearing. Pay attention. Open your ears. Ask God to open your ears that you may receive His Word. Why is it important to have your ears open? Okay? Expect to hear from God. Because in Revelation chapter 2, verse 29, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Holy Ghost, brethren, the Holy Spirit is here with us today and He wants to tell us some truths. He wants to tell you certain truths right now, brethren. He wants to work in your heart right now. There are certain things that I'm preaching that the Holy Ghost wants you to pay attention to, to have your ears open, not dull of hearing, that you may receive it and grow thereby. Alright? But if you're dull of hearing, if you don't think you're going to hear from God, well, you know what? You're going to miss out on some great nuggets of truth. Now, brethren, again, with children, especially with little babies, you know, again, I know as a parent, sometimes parents, you know, babies, they throw up or they need to be fed or their, their diapers, their nappies need to be changed or something, right? And sometimes mothers are doing that and they get distracted. You know, they've got to deal with their child or whatever. Well, you know what? I, I don't expect you to necessarily uh, pay attention or, or uh, yeah, pay attention to every word that I say. 
You know, I don't think I'm that important. <laughs> okay, I'm not that important. Okay, I'm not. But you know what? Even when you're kind of distracted with little children, you know, uh, what I really encourage you to do is, is still pay attention, even if you miss parts of it, because if there's only one nugget of truth that you've learned, it was profitable. Okay? When the preacher gets behind the pulpit, they may have, you know, five, six. You know what? I've got seven points right now. I have seven things that is going to enrich your church attendance. But if you only paid attention to one, if there's only one thing that you, you, you listened to, that you got, and you go, wow, if I make this change in my life, I'm going to get more out of church. Praise God for that. You know, many times, you know, when I've heard preaching, I don't remember the whole sermon, but usually it was just one or two things that was new, that uh, touched me, that I, oh yeah, that's something I need to change. And praise God for that, you know, because when, you, when you're preaching to a whole bunch of people, there are different parts of a sermon that will touch people at different places, right? And again, it's the Holy Spirit that is working in your hearts, that's, you know, that's teaching you certain things that you may hear the Spirit of God. Now, once again, I said, it's not just the preaching, may very well be the song service. As I said to you, I grew up in a Baptist Union church, okay? And man, the preaching, oh, it was dull. It was dull. I, I don't know what I, you know what? When the preaching was on, I was just reading my Bible, or I was reading the hymns. I was okay, what's this hymn about? You know what was great about the old hymns? <laughs> Is that, it, it's, like I said, it's full of doctrine. And I don't know how much doctrine I probably learned as a child just reading through the hymns. Just, oh, wow, that's in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? That's in the Bible? More so than the preaching. Okay? <laughs> praise God. Yeah, praise God. So you know what? The, the song service is important. The Holy Spirit can, uh, can uh, speak to you through song. As I said, someone might, pr uh, might pray. Hey, the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you in that prayer. Why is church attendance so important? Because there might be something that you've asked God. You know, you've gone to God and say, God, I have a problem. I, I need this answered. Lord, can you, when you, can you please uh, show me this answer? And maybe the Lord's put it on my heart or some other preacher's heart to give you the answer and then you miss out on church? Or you come late and you miss out on that part that the Holy Spirit wanted to touch, touch upon you and, and teach you? Brethren, you know what? Expect to hear from God. If you expect to hear from God, you're going to be at church on time and you're going to be paying attention. Not just to the preaching, but you're going to be paying attention to the singing as well. Hey, even the fellowship. Even the fellowship. You know, how many times do I come to church? You know, I was flying down from Queensland, brethren, and sometimes I get really tired. I tell you the truth. Coming down every week before, right? Coming down, I'd be very tired. I'd be very tired. But you know what? By the end of the service, on, on a, what we're doing Tuesday nights. At the end of Tuesday nights, I was so uplifted. I was so encouraged. Because I was, again, with the believers, I was in fellowship. You know, you guys had a smile on your face. You guys encouraged me. And I said, hey, that was profitable to come all the way to Blessed Hope Baptist Church to preach them. Okay, just the fellowship sometimes. The Holy Spirit can speak to you in that way. Where, you know, maybe you, you felt down. Maybe you felt like people around you, uh, you know, you feel a bit lonely. Maybe you come to church and, you know what, just a hello. Hello, sister, how are you today? Hello, brother, how's your week been? You know, just those words might be the Holy Spirit speaking to you to tell you that you have brothers and sisters in the Lord that love you, that want to lift you, that want to lift you up. And you know what? You just saying hello, don't underestimate how important that is. You know what? Someone might be coming to church a little bit down. You go up to that person and, hello, brother, how are you? Is there anything that I can be praying for you about? You know, is there anything that I can do for you this week? Just, just some simple words may be the answer that that person needed from the Lord. The Holy Spirit might be working in you, right, to, to, for that person to hear from God. So, point number three, brethren, is expect to hear from God. Let's go to Romans chapter 14 now. Let's go to Romans 14. Romans 14 and verse number 19. Romans 14. And this kind of builds, builds on from what I just said, right? But point number four, if, to get the most out of church is edify the body of Christ. Edify the body of Christ. You know when you're, when you're new to church, when you, when you first start coming to church, you know, the thought is, well, I want to go to church because I want to be edified. Like, I, I want to hear from God and, you know, I, I want to learn His truths and uh, I need to find a place where I can just, uh, you know, feel comfortable learning God's Word. I know the truth is being preached here. And, you know, when you're that first church-going person, you're kind of seeking your own edification, which is not a bad thing. You know, it, it, it's not bad at all. But what, what, where you need to get to, brethren, is the point where you're not just being edified yourself, but you seek the edification of others. 
That's what's going to get you the most out of church. I promise you, hey, being edified is great. But even better than being edified is when you edify someone else. It's going to make you feel better. Okay? Especially when you find out that brother so-and-so is going through some problem, some difficulty, and, and you were able to encourage him. You were able to maybe give him a Bible verse. Hey, you were just able to say, brother, I'm praying for you, just keeping you in mind. And, and, and you know you've lit up his face. You know, he's going to have a better week this week because you stepped in and you edified your brother. Romans 14 verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Brethren, when we come to church, we come here to edify one another. One another. You know what that means? I need your edification. And you need my edification. And we need each other's edification. We need to encourage each other, brethren, because it is not an easy life to live a Christian life. It is not easy, right? It is, it is challenging to live a Christian life. It is challenging to live a life that's pleasing to God. And the same temptations, the same struggles you go through, I know each of my brothers and sisters are going through the same level of difficulties or some, some type of challenge. You know, when, when, when there's a brother or a sister suffering from some type of illness, I get really upset because, you know, I kind of say, well, Lord, why have you looked after my body so well? Why, why do I, why do I, I, I don't have pains. I don't have these chronic issues, Lord. And brother so-and-so is suffering. Sister so-and-so is suffering. Lord, help me, be an, help me edify that brother. Now, you're going to get more out of church when you say, hey, how can I serve my brethren at church? Hey, getting the most out of church is you serving others. You edifying others. I'll read to you in one, uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. I'll just read that to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Wherefore... Comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. You know why we ought to come to church? For comfort. To comfort one another. Brethren, I, I'm sick of going to the shops and seeing the, the, the advertisements of ladies in underwear. You know, I'm sick of going to, to a place after place and, and the rock music, you know, going to a restaurant and, and the world's evil music. And you know what? This world is, is despicable. This world's crazy. We need to come to church where it's a place of refuge, where it's a place of comfort, when we can, you know, just be with, in God's house, in His presence with God's people, and we say, hey, how can I comfort my brother? That's why we come to church, don't we? we come to comfort. We come to edify one another because we live in a wicked world. We live in a wicked world. And look, can you please, can you please turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, please? Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. I mentioned how I want to have our midweek service become a time of prayer as well, a prayer service during our midweek services. You go to 1 Corinthians 14, and I'm going to read to you from James chapter 5 and verse number 16. James chapter 5 verse number 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Brethren, you know what we're commanded to do? We're commanded to confess our faults one to another. This is not saying confess your sins one to another. Okay, I'm not going to set up some confessional booth here and you guys come, you know, well, you don't call me father, Pastor Kevin. Uh, what do they say? Forgive me, for I have sinned. And I'll be like, okay, my son, go and say 10 Hail Marys and you'll be right with God. <laughs> that's, not gonna, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? That Roman Catholic nonsense, that tradition is rubbish. But you know, our faults are other things. You know, like I said, it might be illnesses. It might be some trial or tribulation you're going through. Hey, it might be some financial hardships. You know, it, 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 just, it could be a variety of things. You know, uh, life, as I said, life is not easy. Living a Christian life is not easy, right? It might be some co-workers that you have that make your life, a, you know, make it a hard time for you at work. You know, these are things that we should share with one another. You know, be open enough and say, look, I've got this struggle in my life. I've got this fault in my life. I've got this problem in my life. Brothers, could you please pray for me? What did it say? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It also, I pray for one another that ye may be healed. Listen, if we're not praying for one another, we're not going to have healings in our times of difficulties. And so it's so important that we come to a place where we feel free to share our faults. Again, not your sins, just your trials, your difficulties that you're going through, so we can pray for each other, encourage one another, brethren. You know, this is how we can profit 
in church. Where did I ask you to turn to? 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 3. This is about the preacher. It says, but he that prophesieth, so that's another way of saying the preacher, but he that prophesieth, look at this, speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Why does the preacher get behind the pulpit? To edify you. Look, if I step on your, on your sins, if I rip your face a little bit, if I make you uncomfortable a little bit, brethren, I'm not trying to destroy you. I, I don't want you to get discouraged. I don't want you to walk away from church. I don't want you to walk away from the Lord. I want to edify you, brethren. If, if, if there's something that's preached that's, and, and you know that's your personal sin, would you say, thank God, you know, thank God for, for sending the Holy Spirit to speak to me in the house of God today. And Lord, help me make the necessary changes I need to make so I can live in accordance to your ways. You know, praise God. Hey, this sermon edified me. Yes, uh, it touched my sins. Yes, I felt uncomfortable. Yes, maybe even a little bit offended, Lord. But this sermon was for my edification. And I know that the, the preacher preached this because he loved me. That's why he preached it. Preachers, remember that. When you get behind the pulpit, it's not just to rip everyone's face. Oh, man, I'm going to just make everybody feel horrible about their sins. No, you know, it's to edify them. Okay? What else? Edification. What else would say there? Exhortation. That's motivation. Right? And comfort. Comfort. We're here to preach to people's comforts. Now, you might say, well, does that mean we can never preach anything negative? Please go to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 10. Second Corinthians 13 and verse number 10. Now, if you know the books of Corinthians, man, Paul was ripping into that church. I mean, chapter after chapter after chapter, that, that church was really messed up. And Paul really had to, you know, uh, correct them on so many things. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 10, it says, Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness. What he's saying here is, look, I'm hoping you get things fixed while I'm away, while I'm ab absent. Because when I'm present, if you don't fix these problems, I'm going to use sharpness. My preaching is going to be very sharp. It's, right? it's going to be hard preaching. I'm going to rip into you, is what he's saying, right? If you don't get these problems fixed. But look at this. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Paul's saying, look, if I have to use sharpness, if I have to be bold and preach strongly against you and against your sins and I have to call you out for your wickedness, listen, the Spirit of God is making me do so not for your destruction but for your edification, okay? So you can learn, so you can grow, so you can be more Christ-like. So brethren, point number four is to edify the body of Christ. It's the preacher's job, yes, but it's everybody's job to edify one another, to comfort one another, to pray for one another. Can you please turn to uh, Psalm, please? Go to Psalm 122 and verse number one. Psalm 122 and verse number one. I better hurry up. I've got seven points. We're a little bit past halfway now. Psalm 122 in verse number one. The Bible reads, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Brethren, to get the most out of church, point number five is rejoice in the Lord. Come to church to give God praise. That's why you come. Give him praise. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Listen, I want you to be glad to come to church. I want you to be happy. You know, I, oh man, church again? Thursday's rolled around already. I already worked hard today. Ah, oh, church. I better turn up because what's Pastor Kevin going to think? I'm, I'm, I'm going to think well of you. <laughs> right? But sometimes, you know, you, you drag the children and you're like, come on, kids, get ready. Come on. It's, you know, it's, ah, oh, church again. You know, I was a kid. I remember being like that. Church again. Oh, man. Church. Oh, we're going to this church. Oh, man. <laughs> but no, we, when, we, when, we, when we go into church, brethren, we need to come gladly. Okay? We come gladly. Come to rejoice in the Lord. Please go to Psalm 84. Psalm 84, verse 4. Psalm 84 and verse number 4. Psalm 84. And verse number 4 says... Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Do you believe that, brethren? 
If you come to God's house, God's going to bless you. Blessed are they, right? But then it says that. They will still, they, sorry, they will be still praising thee. That's why we come to God's house. That's why we come to get the blessing of God and we come to praise God. That's why you come to church. Make the most out of church. Don't miss out on the song service, please. And brethren, when we are singing, lift up your voices. I'm tired of hearing Brother Luke all the time. That's a good thing. <laughs> I want to hear someone else. Start lifting up your voices, brethren. Start lifting them up to the Lord. Say, I can't sing, Pastor. I don't care if you can't sing. Okay? God doesn't, God's given you your voice. God's given some people natural talents to sing better than others. Whatever. And I tell you what, the more you lift up your voice, the better you are going to get at singing anyway. The more you practice, the better you're going to be. All right? No, no offense, Brother Luke. But <laughs> great singing. But you know what? Brett? We all need to lift up our voices. You want to get the most out of church? Lift up your voices. Lift them up. All right? So I can hear. I want to hear each of your voices when we sing praises to God. And I'm just going to read to you another passage. And, you know, it kind of ties in with all of this, but I'll just quickly read it to you. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, which says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. You know, God is not the author of confusion. You know, when you come to church, another reason why I praise God at church is because sometimes I have questions. Sometimes there are passages that I just don't have an answer to, and the preacher gets behind the pulpit, and they preach that chapter, they preach that verse, and now it's clear. It was once confusing, now I get it. And when I learn new, I love learning new things. I already covered that before. I love learning new things at church. And when I learn new things, when I, when I understand my Bible better, hey, that's an opportunity for me to praise God. Thank you, God. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you for opening my ears. Lord, thank you for the preacher who's able to uh, look at that passage and you help him understand it so he can teach others. And hey, that's another great reason to praise God. When you learn new things. And again, to the preachers that get here, your job is not to make it more confusing. Have you ever been to church and been more confused? I have. <laughs> you know, pastor, you know, pastor turns to a passage. It's like, oh yeah, I know that passage. By the time he's finished preaching, I'm like, what? I don't know. Now I've got more questions than what I started with. <laughs> it's happened before. Okay, but God is not the author of confusion. And you know what? If you're the preacher, you're here to make it clear. You're here to open up the understanding so people can uh, learn God's word. And when they learn God's word, they're going to praise God. Hey, they might, even come up, they might even come up to you and say, Thank you, brother. That was a great sermon. I learned something today. Praise God for that. How God was able to use you. And when you hear that kind of words, you get edified. We're here for edification as well, remember? Hey, awesome. You know, all that time, all, that, all those hours, all that research, you know, uh, preaching God's word benefited somebody. Hey, it's nice when that happens. It's nice when people learn God's word and we, of course, give God thanks. We rejoice in the Lord when we can learn new things. Can you please turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9? So I know I've got you bouncing around everywhere in the Bible, but anyway, it's good to do that once in a while. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, please, and... Uh, the, the sixth uh, point that I have for you, if you want to get the most out of church, is give toward the work of the church. You know, give of your finances. So oh, I knew Pastor Kevin was all about the money. <laughs> no, no, this is a Bible principle. This is important, okay? We would not have these walls painted. We would not have this floor carpeted, okay? We would not have new chairs. I don't know when they're coming, but they're on the way. Okay, they're on the way. We would not have the live stream. We would not have so many nice things, Reverend, that we have in our church today. We would not have this wonderful image that, you know, makes it look a lot more presentable if people weren't giving faithfully to church, you know? When you give faithfully, you know, we can do more as a church, all right? Well, we, we, on the 12th of December, we're going to be doing a soul winning mega marathon. Guess what? Guess who's going to pay for the lunch? The church is going to pay for the lunch. All right? So, you know, when, when things come, when, when the finances are given to the church, it means we can just do more for the Lord. Right? And, and this is an important principle. I already, you, let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. I was going to go to 1 Timothy 5, but I already covered that uh, on Sunday. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 9. It says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Now that is in the laws of Moses. That if you're using an animal to plow the ground and to work hard, you know, let the animal eat. You know, let, let him get some reward for his labor. But then the question gets asked, 
does God take care for oxen? Does God really care about the animals? And you say, well, I guess he does, right? It's his creation, right? But that's not actually why it was written in the, in the laws of Moses. Look at verse number 10. Or say if he, it all together for our sakes. So he's saying, look, did he say that in the law of Moses for the animal's sake or for our sakes, right? He says, look, for our sakes, no doubt, no doubt it's for our sakes. No doubt it's written for people, not so much for the animals. It says, this is, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and he that uh, thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we, sh uh, that we shall reap of your carnal things? What is it saying here? It says, look, if you come to church and you learn spiritual things, is it really that much to ask that you give of your carnal things so that the preacher, so, that, so the people that are working in the house of God can, can you know, live? So he can, you know, uh, you know, provide for himself and provide for his family? And again, brethren, I, I don't really enjoy preaching this because it sounds like I'm asking for money. I'm not. I'm not. The Lord has blessed me. I'm not asking that. But hey, we see a great principle here that it's, it's important to give to the house of God, yes, for, for many things that we can do as a church, but also to provide for those that are working in the church. All right? It's not for the animals. It was for the workers. And look, you know, I'm imparting unto you spiritual things, right? What it's saying is the spiritual things should clearly outweigh some of your carnal giving. Right? It's like, oh, it's so hard to give this week. I don't know. Listen, you're going, to get, you're going to receive spiritual lessons. That outweighs any carnal things you can have, brethren. The spiritual things are so much more important than the carnal things. The spiritual things will allow you to live for eternity. The spiritual things will teach you how to lay up treasures in heaven so you can be Christ-like, brethren. That, is so, that outweighs anything that you could possibly give carnally to the church. But we are called to give toward the work of the church. Once again, the more that we receive in this church, the more we can do. Okay? And look, I'm, I'm not preaching this because we have a problem in this church. You know, uh, over, the, over the months, over the years, this church has been steadily giving more and more. You know, at the beginning, it was just mainly to cover the flights. And, you know, now I can pay myself something for preaching. I pay some, other, I pay some of the other men uh, that get up to preach as well. So, look, th these are good things. These are good things because those that are laboring are laboring for your profits. You want to get the most out of church, hey, bring some of your carnal things as well. Okay, give some, some of your giving. And brethren, that's also going to help you, you know, in your faith. Because I know every dollar you have in your wallet, every dollar you have in your bank account, you, you know that money can be allocated to something. There's some bill coming up, there's some holiday to go to. And you know what, Lord, it's going to be a bit hard to give of my, of, of my things this week, Lord. But if I give to your work, Lord, I'm going to have to step out in faith and know that you're going to provide for me no matter what. And brethren, I can testify to you as the sole income earner for a large family. Okay, My wife never worked since I got married. You know, in Sydney, an expensive city, we bought a house, brethren. Okay, I can testify to you that as long as I put God's things first and I gave faithfully to my church, the Lord always gave me more than I needed. Amen. Always. Amen. You know, my wife would fall pregnant and I'm like, Lord, how am I going to afford this new child? A few weeks later, here's a pay rise at work. Here's a promotion at work. It's like, oh, well, that's how you're going to take care of it, God. <laughs> God God's, look, just, just do what God says. Just put God's things first and God will make sure you're going to be taken care of. I promise you that. I've experienced that. So many people can testify of this simple truth. We give to God and God gave us more than we needed. All right. And lastly, uh, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5, please. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12. Point number 7. Point number 7. When you come to church, prepare to apply what you've heard and grow thereby okay prepare yourself to apply what you've heard all right make a decision there's something that you learned there's something you have to do say god help me make that change tonight help me make that change tomorrow morning don't put it off for next week don't put it off for next month don't put it off for next year Brethren, if you get challenged on your soul winning, you know you need to preach the gospel to, to people. Don't say, well, God, maybe in five years I'll get out there and preach the gospel. Maybe in ten years I'll, I'll tell my, my uh, family about you, Lord. 
hey, just make a decision today. I'd say, look, if, if you don't do it today, you're not going to do it. Okay? Just when, to get the most out of church, listen and apply what you've heard, and that's what's going to help you to grow. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number, tw number 12. It says, For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers. Paul is saying to these Hebrews, Listen, you should be teachers by now. You should be the ones leading the churches. You should be the ones preaching God's word, teaching God's word. You should be the one doing that. But then it says here, You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and it becomes such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Brethren, if you've been going to church for years, for decades, after decade, after decade, and you can't teach God's word to others, there's a problem. You know what that means? You've come to church, but you never applied what you learned. You probably learned a whole bunch of things, and you never applied it, and now you can't even teach others. And you say, well, what about the ladies? Well, mothers, you know what? You are there to teach your children. Okay, teach your children the Word of God. You know, take the things that you've learned from God's house or your own personal Bible reading and teach your children how they can love the Lord and how can they serve the Lord. We all ought to become teachers, all of us, that have been in God's house for a period of time, listening to His preaching. And if you're not teaching others, you know, grandparents teaching the grandchildren, etc. You're not, not all going to stand behind a pulpit and teach, right? Hey, teaching the gospel to people, preaching the gospel. We are all called to be teachers. If you don't apply it, then you're going to lose it. And you're going to be someone that needs the milk like a little baby rather than be able to, able to take in the strong meat of God's word. You know, there's been a time where I've, you know, I was uh, in Chile for three months and uh, I didn't do any soul winning during that time. And when I got back uh, to Sydney and I started soul winning, I was so rusty. I kind of forgot my plan. I kind of forgot the memory verses. It was all jumbled up, right? Because there was a period of time where I wasn't teaching God's Word anymore. And then, to, you know, after a little while, I was able to get back, you know, get back into it and stuff like that. Well, you know what? Church is no different. You might hear some great truths in church. I'm sure you've heard some great truths in church, okay? But you've forgotten it. You didn't apply it. Or you thought, well, maybe next week I'll do it. Next month I'll do it, Lord. And you've forgotten. Okay? And you're back like that little baby. You still need the milk of word, the word of God uh, again, rather than the strong meat. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Wow. You can deceive yourself. How? By being a hearer only. Oh man, I heard so many things today at church, but you don't do it. You're going to forget it. You're going to forget the things that you learned, and you're deceiving yourself. You're thinking I'm mature in the Lord. You think I I'm a great Christian. I'm growing the Lord, but you haven't applied what you've learned. What's the point then? Just to hear some guy scream behind the pulpit? What's the point? You know, I, I would rather you just take one. Hey, I've got seven things here. Just take one, brethren. Take one and apply that one. And I promise you, just, if you just take one of those things, you're going to have a better time at church. Church is going to be more profitable for you. Okay? So let me summarize those seven things once again. Number one, do not make church attendance a decision. Number two, remove all distractions. Number three, expect to hear from God. Number four, edify the body of Christ. Don't just seek your own edification. You edify others, right? Number five, rejoice in the Lord. You know, go to church with a happy face. Number six, give toward the work of the church. And number seven, apply what you've heard and grow. Okay, let's pray.